time to have your Bibles. Open your Bibles, please, to James 4. We're going to finish James 4 today, Lord willing, and uh, get into James 5 next week, Lord willing, also, as we learn in James 4 to say at, when we plan our times, if the Lord wills. So, James 4. And I have here on the opening slide Ephesians 4, 31 to 32, because Paul is bringing in, brings in some of the same things that James is speaking about. So let's read Ephesians 4 here from the slide. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And before we go any further, I'd like to ask prayer on our lesson study, on our time together. I know I have welcomed you in a general sense. I can't see without manipulating maybe a lot of things and possibly losing what I have, so I'm not going to try to do that. I can't see each one who's there, but I'm thankful for each one. And let's ask God's blessing now before we go any further in our study. Father, we're thankful that we have this time this morning to open your word, to gather together as a body of believers, and to um, be taught of you. I pray that the words that come forth from my mouth will be what you once said, and that I can say it clearly, so that we can, um, even though we may be challenged trying to understand everything James is saying in this chapter, you can give us understanding. So please guide us in this uh, um, endeavor, I pray. Be with each one who's joined us. Touch their hearts, Lord. Comfort them. You're the God of all comfort. Please draw close to all of us. We need you. Whatever is burdening us, we, we lay at your feet and trust you to work all things out to your honor and glory, for that's all we want. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so, now we're going to, we left off uh, in James 4. We, we've talked much about this verse 1, verse 2, these wars, these fightings. We, we even kill one another, killing with our words, you see. We ask a miss, whatever. But we're down now to um, verse 8. So let's read verse 8 together, please. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Now, Our work, part of our work, James says, is to resist the devil. And if we do this, the promise is he will flee from us. But the question is asked, and now this quotation is taken from Youth Instructor, July 8, 1897. The question is asked, how can I resist Satan? There is only one way by which you can do this, and that is by faith taking Christ as your helper and pleading with him for strength. When Satan suggests doubt to your soul, when he tells you that you are too unworthy, too sinful to realize the blessing of God, present Christ before him. As your advocate and savior, tell him you know that you are a sinner, but that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Repeat his promise. promises, she says. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. 
Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace for, with me. Whatsoever ye ask, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. These are four promises that Ellen White has put together about how we can resist the devil. One is in John 6, 37, Come unto me. No, him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That is such a blessed promise because sometimes we come back again and again to the Savior over the same issue. And you may wonder, is, he going to, is, is Jesus going to be tired of me? coming to him again and again because I failed. But the promise is he will in no wise cast you away. Um, the promise in Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. Then the promise that's in Isaiah 27, 5 about, which one is that? Let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me. And he shall make peace with me by taking hold of God's strength. Let's go on. Uh, this article continues. Be simple-hearted enough to believe these promises of God. When Satan comes to you and tells you that because you are unhappy, perplexed, and troubled, you're not a child of God, do not become discouraged for one moment, but gird up the loins of your mind. Let your heart repose in God. He has promised that if you come to him, you shall find rest to your soul. And if you have done this, rest assured that he will fulfill his word in you. Many pass long years in darkness and doubt because they do not feel as they desire, but feeling has nothing to do with faith. That faith which works by love and purifies the soul is not a matter of impulse. It ventures out upon the promises of God, firmly believing that what he has said he is able also to perform. Our souls may be trained to believe, taught to rely upon the word of God. That word declares that the just shall live by faith, not by feeling. <clears throat> In verse 8, we're told to draw nigh to God. In Our Father Cares 275.2, the Lord loves you. The Lord is of tender compassion. His promise is, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you, James 4, 8. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up for you a standard against him. Bear in mind that Jesus Christ is your hope. In the sad, discouraging things that shall come to you at any time, Christ says to you, Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Going on, your work is to take hold of the strength that is as firm as is the eternal throne. Believe in God. Trust in Him. Be cheerful under all circumstances. Although you may have trials, know that Christ suffered the, these afflicting things in behalf of His heritage. Nothing is as dear to the Lord as is His church. The Lord looks at the heart. He knows who are His. The Lord will test and prove every soul that lives. Now, in James 4, 8, we read about sinners. So let, let me just go back to that verse. 4, 8 says, 
Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts. Now this Greek word sinners is hamartalos, and it's a person who customarily sins. A sinner, an outcast, it may refer to persons who are irreligious in the sense of having no concern for observing the details of the law. Such people were often treated as social outcasts. Um, this is from Lonida, but so the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, etc., treated, even though they might be Jewish people, as social outcasts if they had no concern for observing the details of the law. Harmat harmartalos means the hardened sinners, Barclay, another commentator, says. It means the hardened sinner, the man whose sin is obvious and notorious. Those who are, were admonished to cleanse their hands are called sinners, this word. Greek word, because their conduct was reprehensible to God, even though they were members of the church. Ellen White, in letter 13, 1893, states, While professing to be Christians, many have the mold of the world upon them, and their affections are not set upon God, they are double-minded, making an attempt to serve God and mammon at the same time. But the world's Redeemer has declared, ye cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew 6, 24. By trying to serve two masters, they are unstable in all their ways and cannot be depended upon. To all appearances, they are serving God while at the same time, in heart, they are yielding to the temptation of Satan and cherishing sin. They may speak words that are smoother than oil, yet their hearts are, are full of deception and deceit in all their practices. Professing to be righteous, yet they have an heart that is desperately wicked. And that's how one of the ways she applies what James calls the, the double-minded. Now, we want to go to an important part of James 4, and it starts in verse 11, and it talks about judging the law. So let's read these two verses, 11 and 12. First of all, James tells these people that he describes from verse 1 onward, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgest the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. And I don't know if you struggle with these words when you read them. If we speak evil of someone, if we gossip, if we um, uh, are bitter and, and judge them, we're judging the law. Now, I ask you, uh, first of all, let's just um, consider Matthew 7, 1 to 2, which tells us, judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, before we go back to James, let's just consider this, these verses in Matthew 7. The word judge is krino. And it means to either judge a person as guilty and deserving of punishment, or it can mean making a judgment only without any condemnation. So Crino and Lonida um, brings this out, that it has two different applications. It can mean to judge um, as guilty, judging a person as guilty and deserving of punishment, or it can just simply mean judging without any um, um, uh, attribution of guilt. 
and the word judgment is a form in these two verses in Matthew. Uh, for with what judgment ye judge, that Greek word is krima, which means evaluation. For whatever evaluation you make on another person, that is um, how you will be evaluated. Um, and so we have to decide here in James 4, excuse me, yeah, James 4, 11 and 12, what sense of crino did James mean to use? Is it, or is it a judgment with condemnation or just simply a judgment without any um, aspect of condemnation? condemnation? Now, Jeremiah 22, 3 tells us that there is some judging we are to do. For example, this verse says, Thus saith the Lord, Execute ye judgment and righteousness, and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, and do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. But the, uh, the admonition is to execute judgment. But then I think of 1 Samuel 16, 7, uh, and how there is some judging we are not to do, because man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Desire of Ages 314.1 states, Do not think yourself better than other men, and set yourself up as their judge. Since you cannot discern motive, you are incapable of judging another. Review and Herald, June 5, 1888, paragraph 8. We are assured that as we judge, we shall be judged. That as we met or meet out to others, it shall be measured to us. Again, in view of this, let your words be of such a character that they will meet the approval of God. When we see errors in others, let us remember that we have faults graver, perhaps in the sight of God, than the fault we condemn in our brother. Instead of publishing his defects, ask God to bless him and to help him to overcome his error. Christ will approve of this spirit and action and will open the way for you to speak a word of wisdom that will impart strength and help to him who is weak in the faith. The work of building one another up in the most holy faith is a blessed work. But the work of tearing down is a work full of bitterness and sorrow. Christ identifies himself with his suffering children, for he says, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. If all would carry out the instruction given by Christ, what love and unity would exist among his followers? Every heart has its own sorrows and disappointments, and we should seek to lighten one another's burdens by manifesting the love of Jesus to those around us. So, with that background of Matthew speaking about, not ju uh, Christ speaking and Matthew recording, that we are not to judge, let's go back to James 4, 11 and 12 and try to understand that, because James is the only one that I know of that explains how judging another is judging the law. He doesn't really explain it. We have to dig it out. But he states this fact. He states this connection. And, and I, I know I've said before, just as Hebrews tells us, as no other book tells us the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, James makes this clear. He says that if we speak evil of our brother, we're, we're speaking evil of the law. 
Now this word speak evil, and it, it has the negative attached, speak not. But speaking evil means to speak against, to slander. It's an imperative when James says speak not evil. He's saying don't do it. Stop speaking against one another. But let's continue to consider how this is connected to the law. Um, James makes it clear in the first part of verse 11 that speaking evil of your brother is speaking evil of the law. And judging your brother is equal or is judging the law. And I ask you now, do you understand how, why the, there's this equation of speaking evil of the brother is the same as speaking evil of the law and judging your brother is the same as judging your law? How can James put that together? What is he trying to tell us? First of all, let's go back to Matthew, this time to Matthew 22, 35 to 40. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So we know that um, the law is teaching us to love one another. Uh, going uh, the next slide. Judging a brother, as James describes, involves forming an unfavorable opinion or opinions about him. Only God can read the heart. This kind of judging can impute unworthy motives to others. Remember, evil speaking is slander and can put the worst possible interpretation on a person's words and actions. James told the brethren to stop doing this. Judging a brother in this way also judges the law, which bids us, under these two great commandments, bids us to love one another. In refusing to do what the law commands, one passes judgment upon the law and declares, sorry misspelling, declares it not good enough to be obeyed. Such an attitude is evil, as James says, and presumptuous. It passes judgment on the law and upon God himself. Do you understand this connection? that if you, if you judge someone, that means you're putting yourself above the law in the sense, I am now um, an interpreter, a controller uh, of the law, and um, I'm putting myself in contradiction or contra just a um, position to God himself, whose law it is. So by judging your brother, you're judging the law. And I don't have a chat box to look at your chats. I'll, tr I'll try to get it after I get out of this um, mode that I'm in. And I'm sorry for this. I don't like to just be a mouthpiece. I like feedback from you guys. But anyway, judging your brother is the same as judging you the law because it... Um, says that um, it, it, it means you're passing judgment on the law. And who are we to do this? This is God's law. This is putting us equal with God. I can talk about your law. I can make changes in your law. I don't have to listen to your law because 
I'm, I'm smarter than the law, you see. And, and that's, that's the way I understand, at least, why James can make this equation that judging a brother is judging the law and call, calling your brother evil is calling the law evil. Now, 1 B.C. 1104. The law of Jehovah, dating back to creation, was comprised in the two great principles. Okay, I'm going to move on. It's here if you want to read it later, but it's saying the same thing. That our duty is to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love God supremely and our neighbor as ourselves. Now, this verse in James 4, no, it's the next verse, 12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. And then James asks, Who art thou that judgest another? In other words, are you able to save and to destroy? Of course, they're destroying e each other with their words. But James is saying, There's one lawgiver, not you. You're not giving out the law. Who are you to um, judge another? Only the one lawgiver is able to save and destroy. You can't do that. But who is this one lawgiver? Who was at Mount Sinai? Isaiah 33, 22 says, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. And that Hebrew word law, Lord is Yahweh. Uh, manuscript 16, 18, 90, paragraph 84 states, Christ himself gave the law for Mount Sinai. But now let's look at Acts 20, 21 and see what is said there. Acts 20, 21 states, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, our repentance is to the Father because we have broken His law. Christ gave the law, spoke the law at Mount Sinai, but it was God's his Father's law that he spoke. Uh, and we see that here in this verse in Acts, that our repentance is to, to God. Then in Psalm 40, verse 8, okay, just a second, states, I delight, well, it's here on the screen, to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. So David, or the person who wrote this psalm, I didn't check it out, sorry, is stating, thy law, the Father's law, is in his heart. Now, going on, we read in Numbers 21, 5 and 6, and the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread, i.e. manna. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. That Lord is Yahweh. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. But then in Paul states in 1 Corinthians 10, 9, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. So the Lord that sent the fiery serpents, uh, Paul says, was Christ. Moving on to Hebrews 11:26, esteeming the reproach, talking about Moses, of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, 
for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. That's Moses. And then Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, a little earlier verse than before, and did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ going on. There are a few more verses to consider before we draw a conclusion. Hebrews 3, 17. But with whom was he, Christ, grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? So Christ is identified there with the Israelites. Joshua 5.15, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. These verses, Joshua, Hebrews, etc., show that it was Christ who led the Israelites, but he did so at the direction of the Father, just as the Father is the Creator, but he accomplished creation through the Son. And I um, uh, next think of Exodus 20, verse 2, which states that I, the Lord, brought thee out, and God said all these words, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So the Father did this. Uh, Christ did this, I should say, um, at the direction of the Father. But there's still more. Wagoner and Christ, E.J. Wagoner, Christ and his Father, uh, and his righteousness, Christ and his righteousness. This truth that Jesus is the lawgiver, brackets, helps to a more perfect understanding of the reason why Christ is called the Word of God. <clears throat> Pardon me. He is the one through whom the divine will and the divine power are made known to men. He is, so to speak, the mouthpiece of divinity, the manifestation of the Godhead. He declares or makes God known to man. It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness um, dwell, and therefore the Father is not relegated to a secondary position, as some imagine, when Christ is exalted as creator and lawgiver. For the glory of the Father shines through the Son, since God is known only through Christ, it is evident that the Father cannot be honored as he ought to be honored by those who do not exalt Christ. As Christ himself said, He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which sent him. Now, there's more. Um, but let's consider there's an important concept coming up, and we're getting there, but let's consider some of the things that Ellen White stated. This is in Experiences in Australia, page 154.3. But none could truthfully be called, uh, excuse me, but none could truthfully call Christ a Sabbath breaker. He was the maker of the Sabbath. From the pillar of the, of cloud and from Mount Sinai, he proclaimed the law to his people. Next one, uh, 20 MR 264. Jehovah regarded of such importance the knowledge of his law, of which the Sabbath commandment is a part, that he came down from heaven and on Mount Sinai he proclaimed the Ten Commandments. God regards his law as a sacred thing, which it is the life of his people to obey. <clears throat> doesn't say who Jehovah is, but let's go on. This is the important one. Taken from Signs of the Times, October 15, 1896, paragraph 4, also in 1 B.C., 1103.13. When the law was spoken, the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, stood 
by the side of his son, enshrouded in the fire and the smoke on the mount. It was not here that the law was first given, but it was proclaimed that the children of Israel, whose ideas had been come, had become confused in their association with idolaters in Egypt, might be reminded of its terms and understand what constitutes the true worship of Jehovah. He stood by the side of his son going on. The Lord in his dealings with Israel always magnified before magnified his law before them and pronounced and promised them rich blessings if they would keep his precepts. And when he permitted their enemies to triumph over them, it was because he wanted them to draw nigh unto him and find in him their friend and refuge. So when Trials come to us, brothers and sisters, when trials come to people we know and we feel so badly for what they're going through. The purpose is that we will draw nigh to God and find in Him our refuge and a friend. And so this uh, lawgiver, Christ spoke the law. Christ proclaimed the law there at Mount Sinai, but the Father was beside his Son. That's how important the law is. Now, I want to consider for a moment idolatry and the law. Exodus 20, 4 through 5 states, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. And now I have a little excerpt from the book um, uh, I, Chinese missionaries or something like that. I'll, I'll try to get the title to you. But one of the first missionaries was C. Uh, Lilly. I think that's Charles Lilly. First missionaries to China. And part of his job was to go around to isolated areas and build up the church, establish leaders there that could carry out the work of spreading the gospel, you see. And so as he went around to these different, uh, China 110 years ago was a completely different country than it, than it is now. And one of the things he liked to do, uh, Pastor Lily, was to visit the temples that people had erected with idols in them. And so here I'm quoting him. At the top of the mountain that he was at, 3,500 feet, stands a very old temple dedicated to Shang Di. The steep ascent to the summit is made by stone steps, not a few of them cut out of the solid rock. The view from the summit is wonderful. All along the ascent are temples, some large and some small. Here a person may count gods by the thousand. The temple at the summit has an immense brazen burner which is said to have taken 300 coolies to carry up. I looked at some more temples. On a beautiful hilltop outside the city is a temple containing the most militia, the most miscellaneous collection of idols. I have ever seen. One god has 48 arms. One has a black face. The distinguishing feature of another is his exaggerated eyebrows. Still another has a tripod in his hand or hands. And here's just a picture of one of these temples with all these idols lined up. And a person goes in, brings his offering to the particular idol he wants, 
or she wants and makes an offering. Um, in this particular temple are uh, about 500 idols uh, there on the shelf in the temple. Oops, sorry. Lily goes on. There is another temple that contains clay figures depicting all the supposed terrors of hell. It is the Chinese Buddhist conception of the punishment of the wicked, I was told. What I saw there was frightfully realistic. I am sure that if I were a heathen and believed what I saw there, I should be frightened enough to keep straight one long while. Men and women are represented writhing in the flames, imprisoned in stocks, being sawn asunder, being disemboweled, falling from cliffs, being flayed alive in the coils of serpents, etc. And accompanying each portrayal is an inscription telling what sin the poor creature is being punished for. One subject is a man in a cauldron of hot oil. A devil is standing with a fork in hand, preventing him from climbing out, while another devil is blowing at the fire under the cauldron to make it hotter. And that's C.P. Lilly, Pastor Lilly, with our missionaries in China. And the reason I'm bringing this up is to make it a modern-day application of idolatry. From Review and Herald, October 22, 1895, paragraph 2. He cannot expel God, i.e. Satan, cannot expel God from his throne. But through the system of idolatry, he plants his own throne between the heaven and the earth, between God and the human worshiper. He intercepts every ray of light that comes from God to man and appropriates the worship that is due to God. Another Review and Herald article, idolaters are condemned by the word of God. Their folly consists in trusting in self for salvation, in bowing down to the works of their own hands. God classes as idolaters those who trust in their own wisdom, their own devising, depending for success on their riches and power, striving to strengthen themselves by alliance with men whom the world calls great, but who fail to discern the binding claims of his law. That's March 15, 1906. But going back, no, let's see. I'm not sure it's going back. This is Review and Herald, December 3, 1908. Are we worshipers of Jehovah or of Baal, of the living God or of idols? No outward shrines may be visible. There may be no image for the eye to rest upon, yet we may be practicing idolatry. It is as easy to make an idol of cherished ideas or objects as to fashion gods of wood or stone. Thousands have a false conception of God and his attributes. They are as verily serving a false god as were the servants of Baal. And there's one more quotation. Now we go back to October 22. Satan has wrought with deceiving power, bringing in a multiplicity of errors that obscure the truth. Error cannot stand alone and would soon become extinct if it did not fasten itself like a parasite upon the tree of truth. Error draws its life from the truth of God. The traditions of men, like floating germs, attach themselves to the truth of God, and men regard them as a part of truth. Through false doctrines, Satan gains a foothold and captivates the minds of men, causing them to hold theories that have no foundation in truth. 
men boldly teach for doctrines the commandments of men. And as traditions pass on from age to age, they acquire a power over the human mind. In other words, the older they get, the stronger they get. But age does not make error truth. Neither does its burdensome weight cause the plant of truth to become a parasite. The tree of truth bears its own genuine fruit, showing its true origin and nature. The parasite of evil also bears its own fruit and makes manifest that its character is diverse from the plant of heavenly origin. Now, this parasite that has to attach to truth to have any life that's old over the generations, over the centuries, that's over the millennium, that is part you know where I'm going with this. That is part of Christendom today is the um, doctrine of the Trinity. And just because it's old, just because the church has honored it and taught it for centuries and thousands of years, doesn't make it truth. It's um, a parasite that is clinging to a part of truth. And when we accept that part of truth and accept the parasite also, we have um, created an idol. Alan White talks about it has no foundation in truth. And so uh, since we have focused on the law of God and how the law of God, when we judge our brother, we judge the law. Here, um, you and I may not be judging our brethren, I hope we aren't. We have enough in our own lives to to work with the Lord on. But um, so, but if we are clinging to error and if we are looking at God's law and putting our own interpretation to it, that I am the Lord thy God, that means God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that's man's a, a teaching for doctrine, uh, the commandments of men. And we know that, but I just wanted to remind us of it. Now, we want to come to the close of James, the last verse in James. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Verse 17. Now, for... We'll get an understanding of, is that a definition of sin? Um, the church teaches so. The Ad Seventh-day Adventist denomination, I should so say, teaches so. But let's, before we get to 17, consider verse 16. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing as evil. That's following, uh, I, I want to just make a comment in verse 13. Go to now, ye that say, today and tomorrow we will do such and such. Uh, we read in chapter 5, verse 1, go to now again. That is an idiom, and it means uh, listen now, pay attention. And so in verse 13, pay attention, ye that say, today and tomorrow we'll do these things. And so he has a couple of verses about uh, planning for the morrow. But then he says, But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. And um, rejoice sounds like a good word, but that Greek word really, and I'm not going to pronounce it, it means to boast, to exalt, to take pride in. And so what James is saying is, you're taking pride in your boastings. But that um, word boastings is a different word, and I have it there on the slide. And it means a state of pride or arrogance with the implication that such a basis for this pride and arrogance, there's a lack of a basis for that. It's a false pride. It's a false arrogance. It's based on something that's not there. In other words, James is saying, 
Now you are boasting in your pretentious pride or in constantly talking about how great you are and there's no basis for it. So, when you, unless you know a little bit about the Greek words, it may not make sense. You rejoice in your boastings or you take pleasure or you're happy. That's how we would understand it. But it means to take pride in. Now going on. The word therefore in verse 17 is ein, O-U-N, and it means a result or the conclusion of a process of reasoning. And so James's conclusion is, he that knows to do good and doesn't do it sins. But what reasoning led to this conclusion? Now, the SDA Bible commentary says that it's this part about today and tomorrow you make these plans when you shouldn't. And therefore, um, the, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Um, that's what the SDA Bible commentary states that word therefore connects with this concept of planning for the future not not recognizing that tomorrow is not yours but i would like for us to consider um, how james has put has written this letter to the scattered tribes uh, first of all, he talks a lot about truth in our words. For example, in chapter 4, he presents the fighting, the warring, the slander, the envy, the backbiting, etc., and the killing of each other with words. These aren't literal war wars, literal fist fights, so to speak. It's your attitude toward one another and how you stab people in the back. Chapter 3 also addresses words and tells how words can be a deadly poison, a fire that can't be quenched, a world of iniquity, and that we are not to offend in word. Remember that chapter, chapter 3? Chapter 2 addresses how a faith of only words and of no action is dead. Words are brought in there also. And chapter 1, going all the way back to chapter 1, James presents the word of truth. He starts off with this word of truth, the engrafted word, and that we are to be doers of this word and not hearers only. So um, that's about words, but there's more. Just to recap, the people in James 4, the people James is addressing in chapter 4, were quarrelsome, lustful, friends of the world. They prayed amiss, they spoke evil of one, one another, and were double-minded. They laughed, however, and were proud and boastful and made long-range plans to buy, sell, and to get gain. So, and these were believers. These were um, Christians. James points out their errors here in, Jane, in the fourth chapter of being lustful, double-minded, etc. But, and he gives instruction to overcome this. You draw nigh to God. You resist the devil. You cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. You afflict yourselves. Weep. Mourn, humble yourselves, turn your laughter into mourning and your joy into heaviness. Stop speaking evil of one another and don't presumptuously plan for the morrow. And he told them their boasting or their pride was evil. So this is a summary of this chapter 4. I don't bring in the law, etc., but it's a summary of the people and what they were doing and what they should be doing. He told them what their problems were, and he gave them the solution, stating that 
They now knew the wrong things they were doing and the right and good way they should be going, and that if they didn't do the right, they were sinning. In other words, to him that now knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And, and that's the way I understand this chapter. Maybe you understand it differently. I'm not your judge. Uh, I, I'm just, and I'm not, uh, I'm not inspired. I, I try to understand the best way you try to understand, and that's asking God to guide us. But when James 4.17 says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, he's explained what the good way is, to humble yourselves, to uh, draw nigh to God, those uh, to cleanse yourselves. That's the good way. And now that you know it, instead of um, fighting and uh, making verbal wars with one another, instead of doing this, this is the good way. And now that you know it, if you don't do it, it's sin. I hope that makes sense to you. And let's see, I have uh, oh, a great deal more to share. Maybe I'll go for Pastor, if it's all right, uh, Pastor, go on for about three or four more minutes and quit. Let's see how far we can go now. And now I have scriptures to share with you. Jesus said the same thing in John thirteen seventeen. If you if you know these things, happy are ye who do them. Um, I'm not going to go over the slide of sin. We've talked about that. What I would and okay, maybe I'll I'll do this little section and quit. Um, because we've been talking about sin, let me just go back. I should review what he says about sin. In chapter one, James says, "Lust, when it's conceived, brings forth sin, which brings forth death." Chapter one. Chapter two, he states, "If you have respect for persons, remember the uh, finely dressed person with gold on his fingers, versus the person in vile clothing. If you have respect." Favoring one over another, you sin. Chapter 2 says that. Chapter 4 says, you're doing all these things, this is the answer, and if you, you now know to do good, and if you don't, you sin. So we have sin brought out in various places in James. Now, considering sin, I have um, Signs of the Times, May 16, 1895. When sin has been repented of, and confessed and forsaken, then pardon is written where? In the past I've said written by the sin, and I'm sorry I was wrong about that. She says it's written against the sinner's name. Isn't that wonderful? Not that particular sin, but the sinner is pardoned. Great. But his sins are not blotted out until after the investigative judgment, we know that. Uh, dot, dot, dot. Next paragraph. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, then the sins of the repented soul who received the grace of Christ and has overcome through the blood of the Lamb will be removed from the records of heaven and will be placed upon Satan, the scapegoat, the originator of sin, and be remembered no more against him forever. Praise God. The sins of the overcomers will be blotted out of the books of record, but their names will be retained in the book of life. Great Controversy 611.3 <clears throat> tells us when the times of refreshing are. And um, I'll, uh, I'll unlock the slide so you can read this. But basically she is saying that, uh, under inspiration, that... Um, at the close of the latter rain. That's the time of the refreshing. Uh, just before the red, uh, let me read that sentence. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Here are the times of refreshing. But what I want to go to is this. 
In 2011, the SDA denomination published a book by Ellen White entitled Love Under Fire. And I'm going to read the two last paragraphs, the second and third paragraphs first. Love Under Fire is an adaption of From Here to Forever, a 1982 condensed edition of Alan G. White's classic volume, The Great Controversy. The condensed volume included all the chapters of the original, using only the author's own words, but shortening the account. That's for, from Here to Forever, 1982. This 2011 book, Love Under Fire, is this in the last paragraph. The current adaption goes a step beyond this, using some words, expressions, and sentence constructions more familiar to 21st century readers. It does not it does this not only in the portions written by Ellen G. White, but also in the quotations she included from others and in the appendix material to enhance readability. That's from the foreword of the book. Now, the part I want to quote to you is page 200, paragraph 3, which states, At the appointed time, the close of the 2300 days in 1844, the work of investigation and blotting out of sins began and continues now. Now, brothers and sisters, that's completely contrary to what we just read. She, <clears throat> they are saying, whoever did this says that in 1844, investigation and blotting out of sins began. There is no blotting out of sins until the times of refreshing come, which is at the end of the latter reign. Uh, and so I, I, I'm just appalled. Now, it's true a careless person could have written that, but it can be corrected. I got this from the online edition. It's easy to correct things. But anyway, I just wanted to share that with you, that this love under fire, I'd never heard of this book before until I found this quotation, is uh, supposedly written by Ellen White, and supposedly she said, at, um, in 1844, the work of investigation and blotting out of sins began. Now, it's true. I guess you could look at this and say, the process began, but the blotting out of sins hasn't accomplished. It doesn't say that. I don't know what, uh, how to understand it, but I'm just going to, let me look at the next slide. I really shouldn't start the next part. It's a little long, but it's very important. And it's 10 slides long, and it's now 1048. We have to quit. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for being with us. May God bless you, and may he strengthen and impart his spirit, his truth to you, so that it's part of your very fibers. Let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for your love and for your truth. We thank you for the spirit of prophecy that prepares us for these um, desperate ages, uh, days that are ahead of us. May we be ready. Uh, may we not be double-minded and lose our footing, Father. Let us be strong and courageous through your power. Teach us your ways. Forgive us of our sins and help us, Father, to uh, come to you no matter what we've done because you will not cast us aside. So please, let us all be part of the family of God, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And I see, I can see some. Lori says, the times of refreshing are the latter rain. Well, it says, uh, Lori, at the close of the latter rain. So if something happens at the close of the latter rain, let me go to that particular slide. Yes, GC 6... 11.3, and it goes to 612.1. But she says, um, the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. 
Here are the times of refreshing. Okay, thank you, Laurie. All right, I have to close. I'll try to get a, a handle on your comments. May God bless you. Bye for now.